Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for always loving us. Lord, no matter what, what we do, no matter how we act, uh, God, no matter how good or bad we are, uh, that you are always there to love us. I pray that you would show us what your discipline looks like, what your compassion looks like, what your mercy looks like, what your holiness looks like. Father, I pray that in all these things we would just come to get to know you better, come to get to know your character, how good you are, and experience an eternal relationship with you. We love you, we thank you, and in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Again, thank you for joining us. Last week, Pastor Chris uh, brought us a great message about identity in God. Um, I had a chance to listen to it, and, and it, was, it was wonderful. And so if you want to hear more of Pastor Chris, just pray that, that God takes me off the pulpit more often. Um, but I had a great time being able to speak at a church retreat uh, for another Korean-American independent church um, that doesn't have a, KM, uh, a Korean ministry attached. And, and as I was even speaking to them, uh, realizing a lot of our problems as independent English-speaking church uh, with a lot more Korean, Asian-Americans, um, realizing a lot of our problems are very similar, uh, a lot of our growing pains are, are very similar, and just how um, it was an encouragement even to myself to realize um, just the beauty of God's kingdom and just how, how the gospel is effective and powerful no matter where I preach and no matter where we go because God is powerful and effective wherever we go. Um, it was refreshing. I'm glad to be back home. Glad to come back to some snow. Uh, it, was, it was kind of hard to get home uh, when, I, when, I, when we flew back. Um, but it was, it was a good time. And I think what I miss the most, and again, this is just what's going to end up happening as uh, being, being your pastor. The thing I miss the most wasn't really you. It was my kids. <laughs> it, was, it was my wife. And as, as good as it is to see you, uh, I, I really was so thankful to come home. Uh, I came home real late, so I saw them in the morning. But in the morning when they saw me, it was just like this, oh, daddy's home. And it was such a great and warm feeling to have inside. Um, and I, I don't know, I, I guess it's a little different now, now that I have kids. Traveling is not fun anymore. It's not something where when I was younger, it was like, oh yeah, I get to, I get to go on an airplane and go to the airport and travel. Now it's kind of like, man, I just want to get home. And, and just seeing my kids' faces um, is just so, so warming in my heart. But I also realized that being a father, being a dad, you don't always get the happy faces, and I think this is, this is kind of uh, what ends up happening when I talk with a lot of the younger ones, uh, the young adults, the ones that uh, look at my kids. Uh, and I mean, even at this retreat, when I showed pictures of my kids, they're just like, oh, they're so cute. And I, I, I always, I'm like, yeah, they're so cute. But you haven't seen them when they are, when they're crying and they're screaming, when they're being bratty, when they have all of their mood swings and all of their, like, their, the sinful, evil side comes out. And, and I think when I, when I talk to people, especially they don't know my kids, that have never met my kids, um, they, they kind of look at them and they're like, no, there's no way. They're like, they're angels. And I'm like, yeah, but they're devils inside. Um, but what happens as a father, when I see my kids acting this way, a lot of times, a lot of times what ends up happening is you have to kind of understand from their perspective uh, what they're thinking and, and how they're dealing with their disappointments in life. And a lot of their temper tantrums come from disappointments, is that they have something um, that they wanted and they don't get what they wanted. And sometimes they get what they wanted, but it's not exactly what they thought it was going to be. So they are disappointed even when they get what they wanted. And, and I don't even know how to explain this uh, really without having you come and enter my home. But there are times where one of our kids will ask and they'll say, you know, I want pop and keem. I want rice and, and seaweed um, for, for dinner. And, and so it's like, okay. And so we'll make them, we'll make them pop and we'll make them keem. We'll add some spam. We'll add whatever. And as soon as we, we put it on their plate... We put it on their, on their thing. They're like, no, macaroni and cheese. You want to kick them. You want to just be like, we spent this time making this food, and then when you make the macaroni and cheese, they're like, no, I want cereal. It's like, it's, oh, you just want it. It drives you crazy because a lot of times what ends up happening is when you give your children something that even if it's what they thought they wanted, 
they realize that, nah, I want something else. And as a parent, the correct response, the correct response is, is what I'm learning. Sometimes it's like, hey, you got to eat it. Eat either this or you just don't eat. Eat this or you don't get anything. This is what you need. This is what's going to keep you alive. If you don't eat this, there's nothing else for you to eat. And for kids, the response is, is, is pretty universal. <laughs> I just cry. I hate my life. This is the worst. Like, how could you be so mean? I wanted this thing. You didn't give it to me. Or, you know, I think when I was a kid, the thing was, it was when you ask your parent for a toy or you ask your parent for a, a game console and they give you the knockoff version of it. I mean, I remember, um, it, I, I, I distinctly remember, you know, you want, you want this game. I wanted this one game, and I wanted Tetris, I think it was. And, and they give you something where it's like a total knockoff, and it's like not even Tetris. It's, it's some Chinese version, and you play it, and you're like, this isn't even what I wanted. And you get so angry and so disappointed because you're like, this isn't what I expected. I wanted something better. What, I, what I'm beginning to realize is just because we grow up and we're no longer children doesn't mean we deal with the same kind of disappointment doesn't mean that we don't deal with missed expectations. And I've, I've talked in the past about missed expectations. But today what I really want to talk about is the heart of the Father, of God. And how there are times where we have our prayers, and in our prayers, we are praying for things that are very specific, and they are very good, and God agrees. And God agrees with our prayer, and the answer is yes. I will give this to you. I will give this thing that you are asking for, and I'm so thankful that you've been crying out and asking it from me. But I think what we have learned, what I have learned in being a Christian, is sometimes when your prayers get answered with the thing that you're asking for, the way in which God answers it is so uncomfortable, it's so difficult, it's so, it's so hard. And I'm going to go into more of, of what this looked like in, in my life. But what I've come to realize is sometimes when we pray for something, God isn't even that interested in answering our prayers. He's more interested in us learning how to trust him. He's, he's more interested in us learning how to rely on him, even though he wants to answer our prayer. Even though the answer to the prayer is an emphatic, yes, I will give you what you want. I, I will give you what you've been asking for. What God really wants is not even just to answer your prayer. He wants us to fall in love with him. He wants us to be enamored by him, to come at his feet and just bow and worship him more than being so thankful that he answered our prayer. Today we're going to look in the book of Exodus and we're going to be in chapter 5 and a little bit of chapter 6. But what we, what we are learning is, is that the people of Israel and before Israel was even a country, the, the Hebrew people, the people of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, they have been enslaved. They have been put into servitude of the Egyptians. And as they are working, as they are, are, are being beaten, as they are being forced into this kind of slave labor, they are crying out to their God in heaven. They are crying out to the one true God, save us, deliver us from this bondage, from this slavery that we are being put under. And what I want you to know is that God's answer to the people of Israel's cry, the people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when he sees his people being in this terrible, terrible circumstance, this, this incredibly difficult situation, God's answer isn't, eh, I don't care about you. You're in slavery I don't really want you to be freed. It's better for you to be enslaved than to be free. So you know what? Just suck it up. Just suck it up and do your work, and everything's going to be okay. No, that wasn't the answer. And, and in a lot of ways, that is not God's heart when you are in a difficult situation. 
When you are in a difficult situation, a lot of us assume that God is going to respond to our prayers by saying, suck it up. Get tough. Just deal with this circumstance. You are in a really hard, stressful, anxiety-inducing, depressing situation and circumstance. And so when you pray, a lot of times we assume that the answer that God wants us to have is just get stronger. Just be tougher. Grit your teeth and just endure it. And, and you know what? You'll learn how to handle this situation. No, I want to push back on that and say God's response is that he sees us in those difficult situations and he desires to save us. He desires to take us out of these hard circumstances. But his main priority is first and foremost. His main priority is that you would love him. He wants to save you. But he wants you to learn how to love him, how to trust him, how to rely on him. That is his number one priority. And so in Exodus chapter 5, verse 1, we, we get a glimpse into how God, how God answers our prayer. So in Exodus chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. The same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, you shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks, as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they made in the past you shall impose on them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, let us go and offer sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men that, the, that they may labor at it and pay no regard to lying words. We're going to stop there for a moment. We're going to get back to the word of God, but we're going to stop because I, I want to paint you this picture of what's going on in this situation. Aaron and Moses are going to meet with, with Pharaoh, with the king of Egypt, and they're basically asking, and, and it's, it's kind of, it's a little different than what I even thought it was. I thought it was going to be, let my people go. They're not going to be your, your servants anymore. They're free forever. They're going to be free from your servitude, and, and all's, all is well. That's a pretty big ask, if, if you ask me. If you are Pharaoh, and these guys are asking to free all of your slaves that are the, the workhorse of your empire— you're not going to let them go. That's actually not what Aaron and Moses are asking. They're saying, Pharaoh, let our people spend three days in just worship. Give us a three-day vacation. Just, just a three-day uh, three of, of rest to go and have a feast unto the Lord our God so that we can worship him. We can have a feast in celebration of God's goodness, of his holiness, of who he is, because this is a part of our religion. It's a part of our way of worshiping God. Just three days of the year, just, just let us go out and worship our God. And Pharaoh's like, man, these guys are lazy. So instead, what I'm going to do is this. Before we were supplying the straw for you to make brick, now you've got to find the straw on your own. So basically what Pharaoh did was because Moses and Aaron, they asked for this three-day vacation, this three-day three holiday so that they could rest and worship God, Pharaoh's like, I'm going to make your life even harder. You're asking me for a holiday? <laughs> You're asking me for a vacation for religious reasons? Who do you think you are? You're just lazy. You're, you're taking these days off not because you really want to worship God. It's because you are lazy people. And so instead of granting what you're asking, I am going to make your life harder. So you have to do even more work. So because you've even asked this, because you say that you follow God, 
Now you got to do double time. Now you got to do overtime. Now you got to go even harder at, at, at this job that was already miserable. And, and as you can imagine, the people, their response <laughs> when they found out that no longer were they going to get the straw that they need to make these bricks. <laughs> what, they, what, what they hear, is, and then just imagine if you're Aaron and Moses going out of that meeting with Pharaoh and, and you're like, wait. God was the one that told us to have this meeting with Pharaoh. God was the one that said, that told us to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. I thought if God is the one bringing the word and God is the one saying, if you tell Pharaoh, let my people go, my people will be freed. If, if you're Moses and Aaron and you're like, all right, I guess if we go to Pharaoh and we say, let my people go, God is going to do something in Pharaoh's heart that's going to make Pharaoh say, of course. Of course I'm going to let you go because God and I had a talk and, and he told me that, you know, in a dream that, that you should be given that three-day holiday and so your people can go and feast and, and you can do all these, all these things. Could you imagine how dejected Moses and Aaron were? They come out of this meeting and they're like, God told us that we would be freed, but now our people are even harder worked. And imagine as Moses is kind of this murmuring, babbling kind of guy, like he has a stutter, going out into the meeting halls with his people, like when they're eating and they're all just gathering together. And he's like, uh, guys, I, I talked to Pharaoh <laughs> and I told him what God said, the word of God. And uh, now you guys have to work even harder. The people's response probably was like, Moses, we're going to kill you, dude. It was already hard on us. You're the representative. You're our leader. You're the guy we're supposed to follow. You just made things worse. You suck. You, you made it even harder for us. You didn't make our lives any easier. You made it so much more difficult. Now I got to do, do so much more work. Now I have to sacrifice so much more. I'm never going to have time with my family. Now I have to go out in the middle of the night, out into the field and find straw for my bricks. Moses, you're the worst. And Moses, Moses is kind of a sensitive guy. And I, I, I empathize because I'm a sensitive guy. And, and being in that situation where you're doing what God is calling you to do, what you're supposed to do, and it fails, it shakes your faith. If you're Moses, God has told you, I'm going to free my people. If you're Moses, you're like, God, yes, I totally believe you. I mean, I, I saw you in a burning bush. <laughs> I mean, I saw you and you, you spoke to me. You told me that you are going to free your people and we, we have a promised land. But Moses, in his first moments, away from the burning bush, away from that experience he had with God, talking on behalf of the Lord, fails miserably. To a point where even the people that he was supposed to lead are looking at him and questioning his leadership. So in Exodus chapter 5 verse 22, we see, Then Moses turned to the Lord, which is what we should do when we encounter failure. Especially when it's when we believe that it's God who put us on this mission. Moses turned to the Lord. We should turn to the Lord. And Moses said, O oh Lord, why have you done evil? Ooh, that's a hard, hard thing to say to God. God, why did you do evil? Oh Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Okay, well, I'm just going to stop right there. This is actually the kind of boldness that our prayers need to have. The honesty that our prayers need to have. That I think a lot of us don't really have the courage to pray this way to God. And I think it's, it's healthy. And, and a, lot of people want, um, a lot of times when people ask me how they should pray, I just say pray honestly. Pray from your heart. And they're like, what if I want to curse at God? You know what? It's not that it's good that you should curse God. Don't curse God. But speak with the passion or speak with that emotion you have to God because that's what Moses is doing here. God, why didn't you do evil to your people? Didn't you say that you were going to deliver the people? But you didn't deliver them at all. You just made their life even worse. There is so much honesty that's coming from Moses. So let's move on. In chapter 6, verse 1, the Lord responds to Moses. It says, But the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see 
what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of this land. God spoke to Moses and said, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Oh, this is where the Lord responds in a, in a very satisfying way, and yet unsatisfying. It's satisfying because of the theological implications of what God is saying. He's saying, I, I hear their cries, I hear their moans, I hear the pleads, but I'm going to use this. I'm going to use the stubbornness of Pharaoh to release my people. And I'm going to lead them into the land that I promised their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm going to lead them into the land of Canaan that I have promised and I have made covenant with. I have remembered my covenant with my people. See, this is, this is comforting for Moses because as he experiences failure, utter failure, he is reminded that God is his father, that God remembers his promises. And not just the promises made unto Moses, but the promises made unto Moses' forefathers, unto, unto Moses' great, 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 great grandfather. That God is not limited to just what he told Moses. God is going to keep the promises that he's made throughout history. And this should be comforting to us because no matter how bad things may seem, God always remembers. God always knows. God always will accomplish the promise he made unto you and unto me. And for us, the covenant we live under is the covenant made in Christ, which guarantees us eternal life with Jesus, which guarantees us a covering of the multitude of sins that we commit, guarantees us that no matter what sin we have ever done, no matter what fault we may have, no matter what happens, we can never be separated from the love of God. And no matter what your circumstance, no matter your situation, we can cling on to the promises that have been made. So why is this so important? And I'm going to explain to you something just for, for myself. Is I, I don't really mind it when people spoil movies for me. I don't really mind it when people spoil TV shows. If you come up to me and you know, there's a show I really want to watch and they're like, it ends like this. It won't bother me too much because honestly, at the end of the day, for, for stories like that, um, knowing where it ends, sometimes you kind of pick things up on the way, things that foreshadow and, and, and just little nuances. You're like, oh, you know, he turns out to be a good guy. The bad guy who seems so evil, he, he's, he's really good. You know, like uh, whether you read, you know, whatever books, um, Whatever movies, whatever TV shows, it doesn't bother me too much. But what really bothers me, spoil, like sp what spoilers really bother me, is sports spoilers. When, when, when someone tells me, before I've seen the game, and I really want to watch the game, they're like, oh, they lose by 20. I'm not going to watch now. Like, I don't want to watch it if, if they lose. Like, if I told you, you know, the Broncos uh, aren't going to make the playoffs, which they're not going to. But if I told you, then it kind of makes this point where if there's, if there's no chance, then I'm just going to watch it just to see. I'm mean, just to watch. But it's like, if there's no chance, like you spoiled it, like the season's spoiled. If someone told you, on the other hand, a good spoiler, it would kind of take away a little bit from it. Because if you know, if you know uh, the Broncos somehow managed to get into the Super Bowl, and I told you, with all assurance, they're going to make it into the Super Bowl, it wouldn't spoil it necessarily, the spoilers are usually bad in sports spoilers when it's like a negative outcome and then all of a sudden I don't care. The, what's nice about good spoilers in sports is if you know for sure, then all of a sudden when you watch that game, if, if you tell me they're going to win by 20 points and you watch the game and, and at, at a certain point in the game they're down by 30, it, it's actually not sad. If you, if you already know that the end of the game that they win by 20 and you're down by 30, then all of a sudden it becomes a little exciting. Like, hey, 
We're going to win. So that means that there's going to be a 50-point swing sometime in this game. It's going to be so exciting. It's going to be so good. The problem, the problem with a lot of times when it comes to these kind of spoilers The problem is we don't really believe. We don't really believe in the person giving us the spoiler. And I think this comes with God. God is telling Moses, Moses, we're going to win. You're going to win. I guarantee you're going to win. It's going to be good. It, everything is going to be okay because I'm your dad. And as your dad... I'm not going to let anything I'm not going to let anything harm you in a way that's not going to grow you. I'm your I'm your father. I'm not going to let anything in this world harm you to a point where it's going to leave you debilitated. Everything I let happen to you is for a reason. And at the time it's going to seem like it's life and death but your life is in my hands. And even if death comes to you here on this earth, I guarantee you that you will spend the rest of eternity with me. So Moses, not even death can bring failure to you. Because in death we find life, eternal life. There is no losing cuz spoiler alert. No matter what your life turns out to be, you're going to spend the rest of eternity with with me. And as a believer, when I read this promise of God remembering his covenant with the people of Israel, it 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 reminds me to remember the covenant that God has made with me, especially as our church does communion. It's that we have this new covenant in Christ that no matter what we do here on this life, that our life is going to be made good is going to be made whole not on how much money you have or what position you hold or how many friends you have or or how many kids you have or how good your spouse is that our life is going to be made whole because of what Christ has done on the cross so no matter how bad things get we know God has a plan for it no matter how bad things get God is going to make a way and in the case of the Israelites what we're going to talk about next week God's plan was to bring plagues. God's plan was to bring harsh harsh judgments on the people of Egypt. God's plan was not one that was going to be easy because the Israelites even after they are freed and after God separates the sea for them to walk through that they are en- they end up wandering for 40 years in the desert. But see God always remembers his covenants. God always knew that he was going to bring his people good instead of evil. But from the perspective of Moses, it was evil. How could you make life harder on us when you said you would deliver us? Brothers and sisters, I hate to say it, but you being a Christian is not going to make your life any easier. Sometimes you proclaiming that you believe in Christ means that you are going to be persecuted. Sometimes you invoking the name of Jesus and even saying like hey on Sundays I go to church. Some people are going to look at you and say what? You 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 do what? Sometimes when people hear that you pray they're going to mock you. They're going to ridicule you. Sometimes your life is going to be made much harder because you cling on to the God who is living and active. Your life is going to be harder. But what I guarantee you is that what's better is that you have a God who loves you and can free you from the bondage that you are in. And so my 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 final question for you is this. Do you want to stay in bondage? Would you rather your life be made a little bit more comfortable but remain a slave to this world? Or would you rather have your life be a little bit more uncomfortable but be free and have relationship with the Lord most high. And and this sounds like I'm speaking in imagery, but it's it's not at all. I think a lot of us when it comes to our faith, when it comes to our faith, the reason why we're so bitter 
and, and we, we don't really worship the Lord is because we're like the Israelites in this situation. God, I call myself a Christian. I call myself a believer. But all this has been doing is making my life even harder. You're making my chains that much tighter. You're making my situation that much more uncomfortable. Where is the actual benefit of being a Christian? Wouldn't it be better if when, when Pharaoh says, if you're a Jew, if you are a Hebrew and you believe in God, that you're no longer going to get any straw? That, wouldn't it be easier to just be like, oh, I'm not a Jew. I, I, I'm, I'm an Egyptian. You know, and, and, so, and so, so give me that straw so that my, my job can be done a little easier. See, I think there were some of those people that kind of slipped through the cracks, that they denounced their heritage, they denounced their faith. And so when it was time for the, the Israelites to be freed, they probably were like, I'm going to stay back. <laughs> my situation here is not that bad. I know I'm a slave. But you guys go ahead. You guys cross the Red Sea and go wander in the desert for 40 years. I'm going to stay back in Egypt. And what we even see from the Israelites while they're wandering in the desert is that there comes a point where even though they are free and on their way to the promised land, they grumble and say, it was better in Egypt. This isn't an easy message, and I realize as we go through the book of Exodus, it's not going to get any easier. It's going to hit you hard. It's going to hit us all hard. But what I'm asking you today is, would you rather be bound to the things of this world? Would you rather have God just make your situation here easy and comfortable and successful? Or would you rather be freed? Would you rather be freed away from the chains of this world from all the popularity contests, from all the, the trying to keep up with the Joneses, to all the things that tie you down here, would you rather be made free to experience God in the fullest? For some of us, that means that we need to sacrifice a little more, and it's going to be a little harder. For some of us, it means that we need to be a little bit more vocal about our faith in Christ. For some of us, it means It means that we need to serve in a way that's going to take away from your free time, your precious, precious free time. My question for you is, is, that, is God worth it? Is a relationship, is being under the servitude of God, is being his servant, better than being a slave of this world? This is a question that I continue to ask myself. As your pastor, as, as just someone who preaches every Sunday, I ask myself, is this worth it? Is it worth it for me to come up here and, and preach to you the Bible and preach to you uh, my pains and my struggles, my growth, you know, my, my failures? Is, is it worth it? And I realize, I realize in times where the Lord speaks to us and the Lord brings us out of, our own, out of our own bondage and our own shame and our own guilt. And he introduces me to Christ. This is where I have to speak for myself and not for you. When I experience the forgiving power of Christ, the loving embrace of Jesus, I would rather, I would rather be in discomfort but free in Jesus than to be in comfort in the bondage of this world. Let's pray. Father, I pray that as, as we learn from the book of Exodus and as we experience failures here on this earth, Father, I pray that would not dishearten us, but it would lead to a greater trust in you, that as we experience failure, that we still believe in your plan. That as we experience disappointment, we still believe in your goodness. As we experience frustrations in this life, that instead of giving up, we would lean into you. Father, I pray that our prayers would be honest before you, that we would pray in a way that would be transparent, and Lord, that you would answer us in the same way that you answered Moses, saying that you hear our cries, you hear our pleas, and that you remember your covenant. I pray that as we take communion, that we would remember the covenant that we find in Christ. We love you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before I pray us out, I wanted to share really that if you find yourself in a situation where you feel like it's just too hard, you feel like
being a Christian is just becoming more persecution, that there's more, there's more burden that comes with it and failure that comes with it, that it would be better for you to just quit and call it quits. I'm asking that you would know that you are still a success in the eyes of God, that he loves you and he cares about you, and he remembers the covenants he made with you through the blood of Jesus, that you are victorious, that you have won. And so no matter how bad things may seem now, I guarantee you that in Christ, that in the Lord, that we are victorious and you will prosper. It just may not happen in the way that you think. And so when we are in times of struggle and times of defeat, would we just look with eyes of anticipation to see how God is going to make it good? Because God makes good everything. God makes everything good for those who love him. Father, I thank you for this day, and I pray that although we experience what seems to be failure, like Moses and Aaron did when they spoke to Pharaoh, that even though what we may experience may seem to be failure, that it's still a part of your sovereign plan. Father, I pray that we would just trust you, we would love you, and that even in times of failure, we would still have a great faith in you, and we would cling on to you for the answer. And so, Father, let our prayers be real and raw. Let us ask you, why did you let this evil happen unto us so that you can respond tenderly back that you would say that you remember your covenant with us you hear our cries you hear our groans and that you will make good on your promises and now may the lord bless you and keep you may the lord make his face to shine upon you and may he be gracious to you may the lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit we pray amen